guys, you're listening to Totally Stoked Podcast with Amelia Travis, yoga teacher and wild child turned multi six figure business coach, writer, speaker, and spiritual warrior. Totally Stoked is an experiment in radical honesty. On this show, there's only two rules show up and tell the truth. Each week, we share uncensored, truth telling, shame busting conversations with thought leaders, entrepreneurs, visionaries, and modern day mystics revealing their rise to thrive stories, current challenges, and sharing their most powerful tools for awakening, growth, and well-being. This is your place to let down your guard, open your heart, and remember that being human is a crazy, wild ride, but you don't have to do it alone. So buckle up, baby, because we're heading full speed ahead to radical self-love and a totally stoked life. Are you ready? Let's dive in. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Totally Stoked Podcast with your girl, Amelia Travis. I am super excited to introduce you to my guest today. This woman is an entrepreneur, top podcast host, and best-selling author. As a sought-after speaker, she travels around the world inspiring women to get out of their own way and into action around their big ideas, helping them create the careers they've always dreamed of and step into the highest version of themselves. After seeing numerous women in her life stop short of pursuing their own entrepreneurial dreams because of the little gremlins of fear and self-doubt, she realized that we really need more honest conversations about the ups and downs of entrepreneurship in order to show women that we don't have to have it all together to get started. From there, her community, Powerhouse Women, was built. It includes an annual event, her podcast, and really represents the motto that we are not meant to do business or life alone. From the first time I heard her speak, her genuine warmth and no filters approach to speaking drew me in. I think she might be a Midwestern girl at heart. (laughs) She's here to help us move forward in taking action on our dreams in spite of fear. Please welcome my guest, Lindsay Schwartz. Yay! Lindsay. So happy to have you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank um, you. If you guys haven't had the privilege of meeting Lindsay yet on, uh, on social media or on the interwebs, her links are in the down bar. Um, you got to go connect with her because she's on the daily sh- sharing really valuable content that for me anyway, helps remind me to just keep moving forward that, um, that I'm not broken or wrong or messed up because I'm freaking terrified of whatever's in front of me, <laughs> but that I'm just human and that we're, we're all having that same experience together. Um, so, so Lindsay, what was the, when you said that like you saw numerous women in your life stop short of pursuing their entrepreneurial dreams because of fear and self-doubt, was that also you at some point? Like, was there a point before you became an entrepreneur where fear and self-doubt were holding you back from stepping into something that you wanted to do? Oh, hell yes. I mean, I think that a lot of us start businesses for the versions of ourselves that we used to be. And that 100% was me. I could really understand the woman who felt trapped by fear or just paralyzed by self-doubt or feeling not ready. And could easily speak to her because that was my life for 30 plus years. I kid you not. And even I had even started a business, but the way I was approaching it, if I were completely honest, no matter how it looked on the outside, I knew I was playing at maybe 60 to 70% because I was afraid. I was afraid to go all in. I was afraid of criticism. I was afraid to find that 100% of my potential and then realize I still wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And it had me create this life that just was very safe or so I thought, but completely unfulfilling at the end of the day, because I don't think we can ignore when we feel deep down that we are meant for more. And when there is more for us to do or achieve or a bigger impact that we're supposed to make, you can only ignore that for so long. So it sounds like you're saying you were successful in ignoring it for almost 30 years. Can you take us back and just give us, give us the quick and dirty on your background, where you grew up and what you thought you wanted to be when you grew up? (laughs) Oh gosh, that's like a much longer story, right? Like (laughs) she's like, well, it all started when I was a young girl on the farm. 
when I was five. Um, well, I am a Midwest girl. You nailed it. I grew up in Wisconsin and, you know, I've always just been like this achiever. I always had really big goals for myself, but I, I fell into this belief that it wasn't okay to, to be that really ambitious, uh, overachiever type. I, I was the oldest in my family and the first one to go to college and always felt the need to like downplay any success that I had. I don't know why it wasn't like it wasn't welcomed. I think sometimes these stories that we make up for ourselves, they don't necessarily have these horror or like horrific experiences that, that catapulted us into this belief or fear. But for some reason for me along the way, I started to truly believe like it wasn't safe for me to stand out. It wasn't okay. I'd rather, I would rather fit in and be uncomfortable in that way, knowing there was more than stand out and risk being ridiculed or made fun of or isolate myself. And I don't think we really realize as a kid that that's what we're doing. So instead I would, you know, I had this ambitious side to myself, like whether that was academics or sports and, and I would give it just enough to like create some success. But, but then when I would get any sort of praise for it, it felt like deep down this little voice was like, you, you people have no idea what I'm truly capable of. Like, mm. you think this is good? I could do so much more. And I thought that, you know, just maybe getting that recognition or the accolades would suffice. But like I said, I don't think we can ignore when deep down we feel like we are meant for more. And do so, you, I got to ask, do you feel like in the community that you grew up in or in your family that maybe you were receiving without even realizing it kind of this cultural opinion of like, don't get too big for your britches or like, it's not nice to always be the best. Um, cause I feel like some people when they're naturally really gifted and intelligent, like I remember being in first grade and like people would copy off my paper all the time. And I would get really mad that people would copy off my paper but I remember at one point I told the teacher about it and she was like, you know what? Like you're smarter than a lot of other kids. So like just deal with it because like mm -hmm. they're going to copy off your paper. So quit complaining about it because it kind of makes other people feel bad. And I wonder if maybe yeah. there were experiences for you just based on how bright your actual natural ability to shine was where you realize like, oh, I got to temper this because it might make other people feel bad if I am. Yeah really, really awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were little things along the way. Like I remember, I mean, my, I had like grew up in the most loving family on the planet and it was just like the slightest comment. I remember like one of my siblings making when, I mean, we, we are so different. Like we could not be wired more differently. And mm -hmm. there was like an argument over, I think it was my sister's grades. And she just fired back at my mom. Well, I'm not perfect like Lindsay, mm. which is like so far from the truth, right? But when you're young and you feel as though you're, you know, she was like the youngest sibling, I was the oldest. It, it's just little things like that that start to chip away. Like, oh, maybe it's not okay. Even though my parents never treated us that way or never, never pitted us against each other. I think it just started to construct and, and support this story that it wasn't okay for me to stand out. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in school, I went to a super, super small school and I was always, you know, the one with the best grades or I would get like awards for like academics and just remember the feeling of being different. And I hated it. I mm -hmm. hated feeling different, but I also wasn't going to, I, I still had this achievement like wired in me that I wasn't going to just sabotage. So instead what I would do is I would achieve but then I would downplay it and I would be like, Oh, it's not that big of a deal. All oh, this isn't really that great. So there were just like these little things that built up. And, and I think deep down what it really was, was I th what a lot of our biggest fears are is the fear of rejection, the fear of criticism, judgment, all of the above. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really until later in life that I even identified some of those little stories that had, had, built up this belief that it wasn't safe for me to stand out and to whatever, shine bright, whatever you want to say, mm -hmm. and actually start to unpack some of that. Um, but it, you know, it did, it, it really affected everything from what I would attempt. So I, then I, I kind of became the girl that didn't want to try anything that I wouldn't be really good at, even though if I w would have success, then I would downplay it. Mm -hmm. But I started to only go after the things that I knew I could be really great at because it started to become my identity. Like I am an achiever. I do well at things. 
So I hated the feeling or the experience of doing anything that I wasn't good at. And I think a lot of us can really relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, my face, my eyes just got yeah. really big and I took a big breath like, ah, oh, shit, she's calling me out. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I feel I mean, that. I still don't love being new at things. I'll no. be honest. I don't. No. I also know that that's where the best growth is. And so now, you know, as a almost 36 year old, like now I'm doing consciously choosing to do things that make me uncomfortable. Like I started taking hip hop classes this year. Oh, like yeah. I started to put myself in situations where I got to practice being uncomfortable and doing something I actually really wanted to do. I love to dance. I always love to dance, but then, you know, started to, to just believe things about how I could only do it if I were like, amazing you know this amazing hip-hop dancer I am not I'm like I'm just like you know a little stiff and my twerk needs some work but I still go and I practice being uncomfortable and just having fun and letting go of my own expectations of myself so what got you started as an entrepreneur did you follow the traditional path of like high school college get a job or did you find a different way to being in this position you are now as as um, a leader of women and an author of a book and producing this powerful event and now doing another incredible event event love with with lori harder you're really making waves what got you to where you are in terms of your career journey yeah the back to the question of like what did i want to be when i grew up it's it even five years ago, I never imagined I would be doing what I'm doing now. And the short answer to your question about that pivot to being an entrepreneur, I had taken my first, I joke, like my first big girl job right out of college. That was actually what moved me from the Midwest to Phoenix, where I live now. And I, I took a sales job with a company. And all I really remember them saying was, we're going to move you somewhere. It doesn't snow. We're going to give you a car and a cell phone. And when you're like 23 from the Midwest, you're like, I was like yes, I made it. <laughs> you do not have to worry about me. Like I have arrived in life. I am great because there definitely was that belief. And I, I think it's more prevalent in the Midwest in like small town culture that, you know, that's, that's what you do. You get a great job, you get some benefits, a 401k. And like, that is like live in the high life. Mm -hmm. um, eventually you move to the suburbs and like pop out some babies. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't long into that. What I, the, the career path that I started on was in the sales industry and I sold flooring. I sold commercial carpet. It's about as glamorous as it is. <laughs> no matter how many times I share the story, I'm like, I love it so much. You're like, I was a carpet salesman. <laughs> a commercial flooring representative. I'm like, no, I sold carpet. I drove a minivan filled with carpet samples oh my as a God, single 23 year old. Yes. And it, what was great about it is it literally did, that was the start of my entrepreneurial journey in that it taught me how to run a business from home. So I worked from home. I set my schedule. I was in charge of a sales territory. So it gave me just that little taste of freedom combined with what could be called the worst timing in history, but it actually was the biggest blessing that I was starting in the company right before the economy crashed. Mm. And I was in commercial construction. So working on huge multi-million dollar projects, constru construction projects that were getting shelved left and right. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden it was like the, the lights turned on and I realized, okay, wow, what might have been true for my parents, that this is the American dream and you get a safe job and that's what keeps you secure. I was like, I have no control over whether or not I get fired. I have no control over this economy. I can't make these big schools move forward on their flooring budgets. And I, maybe it's like the, the type A nature, but I was like, I want I at least need a plan B in case it ever needs to become plan A. And I need it to be something I can control mm -hmm. that no one else can tell me, you know, that, you know, it's not like anything's truly recession proof, but I also believe that like the resourceful side of us can always find ways to generate income if we are willing to think bigger. So at the time, long story short, it ended up like down this road of asking myself for the first time ever what I would actually love to do. And the answer kept coming back to health and wellness. Um, I ended up starting a network marketing business. That was my first business. I still have it. I don't actively grow it anymore. Had no clue, never had heard of network marketing, had no preconceived notion. So I came in like with a blank slate. And that was eventually two years later what I worked myself out of a job with. So I did that for two years and then made the full. So, 
this had to have been around 2008 then that you transitioned into full-time 2008 2009 into full-time no direct sales I actually, and network marketing let me even think back this is like totally <laughs> making me do math so i started my network marketing business in 2010 Okay. And the economy started to really go south in like the 2008. That was when I started my full-time yeah. corporate job. And then I, I left, I remember dropping off my company car and like turning in my laptop on my birthday in 2012, in December, 2012. So it was about two years later. Yeah. And did you, um, did the direct sales, did you do isogenics or what was yes. your, mm -hmm. okay. And so did that for you support and sustain you? And is it still like, did you, are you no longer actively building your team because you built it to where like it gives you a cushion of support and you just branched out into other things that you were more passionate about actually doing actively or what happened with that business? Yeah, that's such a great question. And that was what I thought my path was going to be, right? I would get to this place where I could set things on autopilot and just go and, and pursue other things. I don't know. Honestly, I never thought, I never thought there would be a time where I didn't want to, to continue building that business. Mm -hmm. um, I'm even just trying to like give the, like the highlight Cliff's Notes version. But I think that that, so that experience, going back to everything we were just saying, I was super frustrated in network marketing because mm -hmm. I, I had created success. I mean, at, at its height, I was making about $80,000 a year, which was more than I made in corporate America, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a lot more. And there was like this ceiling that I couldn't seem to, to crack. And I also knew that I wasn't giving it my all. So it was mm -hmm. like this super frustrating combination of beating myself up for not maybe, you know, like not having the success that I thought I should have had for as much time as I was putting into it. And I think mm -hmm. that's a lot of people's story with network marketing. Mm -hmm. Like it's super important to talk about, like it's, it's actually a lot more work than anyone who's actively building wants you to believe. Well, and that's why I kind of want to dig into it because <laughs> like, I know so many people so listening. <laughs> well, and I know so many people listening are doing it. And I think it's really important because I, look, I, I, um, technically am in two different uh, network marketing businesses. However, I don't do either of them. <laughs> I have yeah. no people in my downline. I, that's not true. I have one person in one downline, um, but I actually use some of the products. I use Perium and Young Living. So I'm in them, yeah. but I've never t really tried to understand how it works because everyone who I know who's really in it there's like a great struggle in it. The ones who are doing really, really well and the ones who are, you know, have, have just kind of been doing everything they can to keep that one or $2,000 a month of income, which took them a lot to build. So yeah. I think it's really important to talk about because it was, it was a, it was a transition. It feels like for you, or it helped you transition from corporate into being self-employed, mm -hmm. but it sounds like they, there came a point where, um, maybe, and I'm just guessing here, but like, maybe you weren't putting a hundred percent into that because it like goes back to the same thing that you said that ultimately it wasn't fully in your control. A, B, it wasn't something that you really birthed and created and were like, this is this thing that I made and it's the most amazing thing. And so I can pour a hundred percent of myself into it. And then I feel like there's this kind of third thing, which is that people really don't like to talk about, which is that and I'm not saying in all network marketing businesses, but in many, there is a lot of pressure for you to leverage, I won't say manipulate, I'll say leverage your existing relationships for the business. And for some people who don't find a way to do that in clear, like aligned integrity, it can be harmful in their relationships with other people, or it can feel like it's just kind of this like, hamster wheel of trying to get everyone you know to participate in something. And I think that can be challenging. So why yeah. was it not for you? Why was it ultimately not the path? Yeah. So, I mean, I've seen all of the above, everything you're saying. And the, my story wasn't quite that, although I had to like smile when you were talking about, like, I would watch, I would watch leaders, like literally just be like, isogenics everything all day long. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's just not me. Like mm -hmm. it just, that's just not authentic to me. 
And what, so what started to happen, this was the pivot that I never intended to make. I truly thought that I would keep building an isogenic business. I, I actually still love it. I love the company. Mm-hmm. Like I, I wish that I could, I could build two things and give them my all, but I, mm-hmm. I ultimately got to the point where I couldn't, I couldn't grow two things at the same time. But what inspired the pivot that I never intended to make was as I was building this network marketing business and I was, I was always super transparent, but people just make up what they want to make up out of what they see on social media. So they'd see us traveling. They would see, you know, that they would see the freedom side of it. They somehow seemed to miss the posts where I was like, you know, I put in a lot of time and energy to this. Mm-hmm. And I was always really open about that, but inevitably people would say things like, gosh, it would be so great to be my own boss. Or I would love you know, as I was having conversations and connecting with women about what their bigger dreams were, a lot of them would say, you know, I don't feel like isogenics is the thing for me. I'm super inspired by what you've done, but I, I have this other idea. And they, it would just lead to this conversation where they would share something they are inspired by or they're curious about. And in the very next breath, they would tell me why they weren't ready. They didn't feel like they were enough. They didn't know enough. And so in my mind, this was probably why I never built the most massive network marketing team. Cause I'd be like, okay, forget isogenics. Tell me more, like tell mm, me more about mm-hmm. this thing that I see you lighting up when you talk about. And then you know, they would share the, the doubts and the fears. And it would all, every time I would say, okay, first and foremost, you need to know everything you described is exactly how it feels when you're building a business, mm-hmm. whether it's a network marketing business, your own thing, you face doubt every single day you are never quite sure you're doing the right thing because there's no playbook for it. And yeah, you feel like you're going to puke most of the time when you're going after (laughs) something that's like really big and scary. Mm -hmm. Like everything you described is how I feel every day. And I just saw that there weren't enough people sharing that side of it. Everyone wants to share the highlight reel, the car that they can afford, the house. I'm sure there are other women who are very honest and real, but at least what I was seeing in my view at that point was there weren't many people talking about how scared they still were. Cause here's mm-hmm. the thing, a lot of successful women or men love to share. Like I came from, you know, I overcame this challenge and then I built the successful thing. You don't ever hear those people being like, and I ugly cried last week. Cause I still now for my bigger goals and dreams, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm mm-hmm. figuring it out as I go. And I was like, I know those mofos are like just <laughs> as scared as <laughs> I am. Like, why aren't they saying it? And it just like bothered me to no end. So I remember the day. So I was feeling really restless in this season. So this was happening. I was seeing this happen. Plus I was getting to the point where I had invested about seven years into network marketing and just kept hitting the same ceiling. I know that it was no one's fault other than my own. I wasn't willing to get, now looking back, I see like I was not willing to do what was necessary to learn the lesson that I needed to get to the next level. I was just using this, um, and I'm going to come back to this story, but I was using this analogy to my husband the other day. I said, you know, now looking back, it's like I was playing Super Mario Brothers and I was like so pissed that I couldn't get to the next level, but I hadn't killed the dragon yet. Mm -hmm. And like the dragon is like, well, the fear or the doubt or the insecurity or like the lesson you need to learn in that season in order to become the person who can handle more success. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, just running around the castle instead of like slaying the dragon and going toward what was most uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. I would just run around and then it'd be like, why am I not getting to the next level? And Mm -hmm. like, you just don't (laughs) until I know I'm like, this is like profound. I think I should write a book on super Mario brothers and how relevant it is to entrepreneurship. But I, now I see that because I've slayed some mother effing dragons Mm -hmm. in this new journey but it, for me, it didn't happen in network marketing. Network marketing for me was the, it was the perfect training ground. And it, it made me just frustrated enough that when I got this fateful phone call in January of uh, 2016, that it was, it was sort of like this op- opportunity to do something different and meaning actually go towards something that scared the shit out of me. Can I say that? Oh, hell yeah. Okay. I'm like, yeah. I don't know what the policy is. On this, but no, it's more so, explicit. Um, so what was the faded phone call? Tell us yeah. That. So I know I'm like, do you like how I just set that up to be so dramatic? <laughs> so at the beginning of that year, I was like, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to turn to the thing that I know, and that's personal development. And so I decided that year I was going to read a book a week, start and finish reading a book a week. 
And I still have a document on my computer that says a, one book a week in 2016. But two weeks in, I had read, I think I actually only read one book in the two weeks. I get a phone call <laughs> from someone who said, Lindsay, I think you should write a book. And I was like, <laughs> excuse me, like, what are, you, what are you actually smoking? And it was this acquaintance of mine who she had seen like my success in health and wellness. And she was a, um, she still is a publisher and editor. And she was putting together this program for entrepreneurs who wanted to establish themselves as an expert in their field. And she said, this could be really great for your health and fitness business. And I don't know what came over me in that moment because I'd never said this out loud to anyone, but I said, okay, if I ever did, which I'm not writing a book by the way, but if I did, I would want to talk about something different. And she asked what, and I, that's when I said, you know, I see all these women who have amazing ideas. I talk to them every day and they're, they're just stopped by all the same things that I'm st I deal with. And they just need to know that they're not alone. They need to know that you can still move forward, even if you have that fear and doubt and you are literally about to puke because you're so out of your comfort zone. And she had this dramatic pause and she said, Lindsay, if you don't write that book, who's going to? Mm -hmm. And I remember walking out of my office and looking at my husband, who's like not surprised at all by any of my big, like I could tell him tomorrow I'm running for office, like for president. And he would be like, yep, that you would. Okay. <laughs> but I said, okay, so I guess I'm going to write a book. And he's like, yeah, of course you are. Like, of course you should. That's amazing. And go for it. So I remember like just feeling, cause at that point, what she didn't know was that I had attempted to have a blog for like three years. I had, I literally had this blog for three years and I published one article per year, literally <laughs> it had three articles on the blog. And I was just so afraid, like writing. I, I wasn't a writer. That was my story. I didn't want people to write whatever I put out because I was so afraid of criticism. And there was a part of me that literally was like, here's your chance. Like, here's your chance to actually do the thing that is, that you don't want to do, that's going to mm -hmm. challenge you and that you don't believe you're qualified to do. Like if you really, and, and this is where her conversation in this phone call really put me in my place. Cause she's like, okay, so I hear you saying you're not a writer. What's different about you than all these women that you want to help get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn you, damn you for calling me out. Cause basically what I was saying is the reason why I didn't want to do this thing to impact other people was because I was afraid and I didn't think I was ready and I didn't think I was good enough. So there was a part of me that just kind of was like, are you really going to step into something bigger? Or are you just going to keep playing the same little game? Mm -hmm. And that one decision and obviously it took, it took a year of getting out of my own way to actually go through the program, publish the book, but that completely changed my life because I saw what it looked like to lean into something I was sure I couldn't do that I was actually terrible at, at first. It wasn't like I started writing and then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like this amazing writer. Who knew? I'm like an undiscovered prodigy. No, my first drafts were terrible, but I did it. I like actually finished something that I didn't know I could do and it changed my life. And it, now it's changing so many other women's lives because I see so many of my friends still not sure that they're enough to chase after the thing that they're being nudged to do. And, mm -hmm. and I think that the world is going to work a whole lot better the more we help women get into action around the things that they're feeling uniquely called to create. Thank you so much for that. And I want to kind of dig in a little bit here because I know there's somebody listening who's thinking, well, that's great for you, Lindsay, but nobody's calling me on the phone and asking me to write a book. <laughs> Therefore, I don't have this opportunity yeah. to slay my dragon or to lean into this thing that scares me. So what I'm wondering, Lindsay, is if you have any insight into like when we're existentially afraid when we're just kind of like, I'm afraid, I'm afraid of all of it. I don't know what I'm afraid of, right? Um, like, do you have any suggestions around? Because for me, A, you just spoke right into my heart. I mean, I have 250 pages of a book that's been sitting in my Google Drive for, I'm not going to tell you how many years, a long time. <laughs> and I'm waiting for that phone call. Like, <laughs> It's like, who's going to call me and be like, Amelia, we're ready for you to write your book. You know what I mean? And every year I put it on my calendar and every year, like, I don't, I don't do it. And I know I, I'm fully convicted that like, that was literally God speaking to me through your mouth right now. Just saying, okay, you wanted 
there's the Holy Spirit. There's chills all over my body. Like I wanted confirmation. There it is. Great. Yeah. But I know that there's people listening who don't know what their dragon is in this season. They don't, they, they're struggling to just identify like what that thing is. So do you have any insight for if they're feeling stuck with no clear connection to purpose or even direction on figuring out the thing that scares them, but they are feeling that growing pain of knowing that there's something else for them. Yeah. Can, how can you help them start to figure it out? Like even knowing what the twinkle in their eye is of the business baby that they want to birth or the, yeah. the passion project that's calling to them or the big adventure that they're supposed to take you know, or spiritual journey or whatever. How, how do they start to figure it out when they just feel um, lost? Such a great question. And I talk with women in our community about this all the time. And what I want you to hear is that if you're in that season where you feel it's undeniable that you're meant for something more, I bet that's why you're listening to this podcast because you are in that place where you just know you want more for your life. You feel like there's more. And then there's a lot of us, and I'm putting myself in this category because for so long, I would say the same thing. And it was almost as though I expected like an Amazon delivery, someone to come and like knock on my door and hand me this box and be like, here it is, your purpose <laughs> delivered to you. And Did, I bet you just, Amazon delivers those, you guys. <laughs> it, I mean, them. nowadays... <laughs> Maybe Jeff not in Bezos 2000, is listening and figuring it out right now. 2007, <laughs> that probably wasn't true. But like nowadays, it might be. It actually might be. But now looking back, and I really want you to know, like this didn't become clear to me until I got further along in the journey that I looked back and I saw that it was less about like just all of a sudden being like knighted with this purpose that then you feel confident to go and pursue. And it was more about what am I interested in? What am I curious about right now? So back when I was feeling like I needed a plan B, when I was working my corporate job, I was doing a lot of personal development. And I just remember like being kind of obsessed with this idea of like, okay, there are people in the world who get paid a lot of money to do things that other people do for vacation. So like professional golfers are paid to golf all day long. And like my dad, when he was um, still working, couldn't wait for his one week of vacation a year so he could golf. And I was just like, look, if I'm going to put my time and energy into anything, what would I actually love to do? Because I know, I think deep down, it was like, I know that like, I'm an achiever. I can figure out how to make something successful. And so that was what led me to, I think I would love to do something in health and fitness. And I didn't just automatically start this nutrition network marketing business. First, I was like, well, okay, I really love taking spin class. And I went and got certified to teach spin. The first like really scary thing I remember doing was like a spin class audition to like teach at a studio. Mm -hmm. I was so scared out of my mind because you have to teach a spin class to like one person. And I just remember like that was a new sensation for me to lean into that little fear. Now mm -hmm. I taught spin for a year and I hated it. Mm -hmm. That was so not the thing, but it taught me some other really useful skills. It taught me how to be more confident in front, like commanding a room. I had to be really organized and like plan out the classes. It was so not worth the pay. It was like 20 bucks a class. And I spent more than that in gas driving to the studio. But you know, there, for every entrepreneur that you see, there's some kind of small and humble beginning that didn't show up on Instagram. Mm -hmm. it's, it's doing the things that just pique your curiosity right now. And if you don't feel those, cause I'm sure there's going to be that person who's like, but I don't, I'm not curious about anything. Then I, you're probably sitting on your ass. I was going to say, then you need to stop watching Netflix and like, seriously, <laughs> shut off your internet for a week and see what you get curious about. Maybe it's like botany. Yeah. You'll be looking at your plants like, wow, look at how those grow. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Or here's the other thing. Cause there's some of you that, cause if someone would have said that to me, I would have been like, you don't know me. Cause mm. I wasn't, I wasn't sitting on my ass, but instead my version. So you have to know yourself. This, this comes from self-awareness. You're either so paralyzed by fear that you're doing nothing or you're doing the opposite and you're filling your life to the brim with things you aren't passionate about and you're not leaving any margin for inspiration to find you. And here's what I'll tell you, your purpose will not shout over a crazy packed life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, your purpose is that little voice that's like, Psst, hey. and if you don't leave space for inspiration to find you, if you're not doing things daily that 
open you up to more creativity. And that's going to be different for everyone. Like being out in nature, taking a walk, a good a good workout for some people is really what helps them tap into that flow of creativity. Um, another practice that I love to do, and this is something I recommend to everyone if you're like just feeling in that frustrated, stalled season, is I have recently like taken back up the practice, practice of writing every day. And I just set a timer for like 10, 15 minutes and literally I'll just free write. I'll just free write and I will jot down things that either conversations I've had that were interesting to me or questions I've been asked or things that I'm struggling with. And if you can't find any inspiration in those things, you might want to check your pulse. And I just say that with so much love because I think it's such a lie if we tell ourselves that we're not, we have no idea what our purpose is. It's probably Mm -hmm. either such a tiny step you're overlooking it. Like go in, if you, are curious about teaching spin class, go get certified and see what happens. Or if you're curious about taking an art class or like, join me at hip hop. It's so freaking fun. And that's why, like, that's why I'm taking hip hop in this season. Cause right now there wasn't really anything that was making me super uncomfortable, but I know that that's usually where the best inspiration for the next step comes from is when I throw myself into the thing that I'm super curious about. And it's also made a little scary, kind of like, has me step into fear in order to do it. And I don't think that I'm going to like become Beyonce's backup dancer, although I'm open. I'm available. Don't sell yourself short, girl. That might be the next phone call. (laughs) At least right now, that doesn't feel like it's really speaking to me. Um, But here's the thing. I'm just like really, I'm so fascinated by the fact that we're all interested in different things. Mm -hmm. Like I fully believe that certain interests and curiosities are being put on your heart because that's something you're, you're supposed to do something with that. Mm -hmm. And it was the, the lie that I told myself was that, you know, I would look around at other people who were in their purpose. And then I would start to question, well, is that what I'm supposed to be doing? And I would compare what I was doing to theirs rather than actually just turning inward and going, well, what am I curious about right now? What Mm -hmm. sounds fun to me slash scary that I could try. And I'm just going to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm, I love that so much. I think following curiosity is, I have full agreement, probably one of the most powerful things, following curiosity and making space for stillness, because those two things um, are going to allow that little, that little voice to bubble up and to, and to guide you. And I think kind of the third thing that was not necessarily explicitly said in that, but is like in learning to listen to the little voice. Because what a lot of us do is we'll hear the prompting or we'll get the message and, and, and God, source, spirit, universe, whatever you want to say, we often get it in a couple different ways, right? Like we might feel that little internal twinge of interest and then maybe we ignore it. And then maybe a second person that we know will be doing that thing or will say something about it. And we're like, oh, that's weird. I was just like learning about that. Like follow the signs and then and then give yourself permission and, and the grace to, yeah, go out and suck at it, to try it, to just, and to not have this big expectation that every single thing that you pursue in the interest of curiosity is going to fit like a puzzle piece into this clear vision of purpose. Because like, I love what you said that like you tried spin for a year and then that wasn't necessarily it. And you know, I feel that way about, I have thousands of hours of different yoga certifications. And when I was in college, I changed my major, not exaggerating you guys, like at least 10 times. That's why it took me 17 years to get a bachelor's <laughs> degree. Okay. <laughs> like, it took me a long time. Um, and it took me that long because I refused to acknowledge from the beginning that I love creative writing and that I can get a degree in writing and that's okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, no, I got to go do criminal justice. I got to get ready for law school. I got to be a clinical psychologist. I have to do all these things that were what other people were doing, what my parents were doing, you know, whatever, what other people around me were doing. And so the other thing I think is like, give yourself like be kind to yourself. Like sometimes I'm talking to younger women than me, than us who are like 25, you know, and they're being so mean to themselves because they're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. And I don't know what my purpose is. And I'm like, how old are you? And they're like, I'm 25. And I'm like, yeah, oh, you're good. Like right now, I like what do you want to do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and I think that's the other thing is this 
is this false perception that there's a destination and that there's like we get to we get to the place where we're like yeah i now i'm here i made it i'm you know because the things that you and i are both doing as entrepreneurs as podcast hosts as you know empowering women they're all things that are really really cool and are part of our passions and we're excited about but i bet and i'm going to ask you so think about it i bet if i asked you like what's next lindsay like what where do you want to go from here that there's still not even necessarily bigger but other visions that you have for yourself dreams that are yet yet to be fulfilled mm -hmm. and um and we're continually evolving right like this iteration of self i'm you know if i had to pick three words i'd say um writer speaker coach like those are the things that i'm doing um but i'm still also a yoga teacher and you know before that managed an art gallery and was a flight attendant and sold insurance and like in every single thing just like you said there were lessons that i needed to learn that are serving me in what i'm doing now and i also know that when i get really honest about my life and i'm like i'm 30 Four, I think I'm 34. For sure. <laughs> I always have so to like pause and think too. <laughs> I know they're different. But when I think about like, okay, well, you know, if I'm going to continue following curiosity and pursuing passions for the next mm, 40 years and maybe longer, hopefully, like, I hope to expand beyond what I can even see right now or imagine right now. I hope yeah. that there's some point in my journey where I'm like, wow, that was a surprise. Like, never thought I'd be here. Um, so I think leaving room for that. So, so right now, what, what exactly do you do every day? Like <laughs> you're an entrepreneur. I know you have your event, powerhouse women, yeah. and you're producing an event called event love, uh, which or may have just happened by the time this publishes, um, which is teaching other women how to facilitate successful events and hold space. What, how do you pay your bills? What do you do? Yeah. <laughs> Great question. So powerhouse women as a business exists to help women get out of their own way and into action around their big ideas. So we do that through the podcast, which is where I give away the free content. And then we have an annual live event, which is really about building the community. But what I'm most excited about that I'm working on right now is working with women in smaller groups and diving deeper in order to really move the needle. So I have um, honestly, I've tested a lot of different things. So the last two years have been like sitting at a buffet and I'm like, I'm going to try this over here. I'm going to try this over here. And also being radically willing to be like, that wasn't it. Mm -hmm. So um, one example is we had a membership community for a whole year. And I found that I didn't really love that model for finding the match between what my skills are, my zone of genius and what our community wanted. And so we actually turned that into, now I just give all that same content away for free on the podcast so I can focus more on developing programs for the women who are already monetizing something and helping them really take that to the next level. So like just yesterday, we hosted a one day mastermind event where I had about 30 women come together and we really planned out like their strategy for 2020 for the new year. And so that will be, as you're listening to this, we're already in 2020, that's going to be a big focus of powerhouse women in this year. And then I'm leaving so much space that that will even evolve and change. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that I'm interested in that are not what I'm going to be giving attention to this year, but I'm super intrigued by investing in other women owned businesses and getting to impact business on that level, more from like a mentorship and being financially invested. Um, but for at least this next year, um, a mentorship program, a ma you know, mentorship slash mastermind program, and then just some other opportunities to meet women exactly where they're at including those who are just at the idea phase or barely have an idea off the ground. We're going to be partnering and doing some affiliate work with other amazing programs that I fully believe in that helped me get started and being able to partner and offer those to our community too. So focusing on both the community building, but then also like really asking myself the question every day, what does this community need in order to really get out of their own way? Like not just talk about it, but like actually move the needle in their business or their pr passion project in a way that gets them on, like at least gets them that first experience of knowing that when I do something that scares me, 
something positive comes on the other side. It might not look positive initially. It doesn't always like come packaged with a pretty bow, but if we could like create that support and accountability for women to, to move forward into the things that scare them, I know that on the other side, they're going to see that number one, they didn't die. And number two, something great comes of it. They either learn a lesson or they find that it, it actually worked out for the better and they built something or launched something beautiful on the other side. So I don't know if that answers the question, but well, it, that's- it does. Yeah. And I think there's um, a quote that I love that says in every failure, there's a seed of opportunity yeah. and that perspective I really believe that is what separates entrepreneurs who I'm putting this in air quotes, but who make it from those who don't is this ability to fail forward and to be resilient and to, and to know that if something fails again with the air quotes, like it's not you failing, you are not a failure. Like the project failed or, or didn't get the revenue that you wanted or, yeah. You, you dis- discovered you don't actually enjoy teaching spin classes. Like, but that doesn't mean that it was a waste. Nothing is wasted or lost. And I think that's what, I think that's one of the biggest things that we have to get, get plugged into ourselves in order to be able to move into that fear, because there's this idea that I'm going to waste time or I'm going to lose money. And that, that somehow the fear that underscores that is that when that happens, I won't be okay. Right. But you look at your life and everything you've been through, and I'm talking to you who are listening, everything you've been through, then you've seen some shit and you're still here. You're still breathing and in, you're smarter, you're wiser, you're stronger, you're softer, you know, and all of those all of those things that were really, really hard, I guarantee you, if you actually sit with them, you're going to be able to see not always why it needed to happen, but the way in which it cultivated the resilience that you now um, use to move through life with more grace and ease. So, so Linz, I want to hear from you on that though. Um, With this mission that you have to really help women move the needle forward, I know like Mel Robbins has, you know, five, four, three, two, one, go. I don't know if you follow Mel. I love like, her. Yeah, I, I totally love her love so much. <laughs> and it's like, that's so simple. And people are like, oh my gosh, like she, and it's not like she's got way more than that. She's an incredibly brilliant woman. But do you have, with the women that you work with and as you encourage them and, and work in partnership with them, do you have some little specific tools, tips, words of encouragement, anything that you feel like this is my secret hack? to move towards the thing that scares me. Yeah. It's, um, I wish I would have come up with five, four, three, two, one, go. I know. (laughs) Damn it, Mel. I love that book so much. And I, I wouldn't say that there's one thing. What's, what's interesting that came out of, and I almost think this, this was a community, a community. Let me try that again. A community chosen mantra that we say in powerhouse women, which is we're not meant to do this alone. It was something I had said from stage at our second annual event, and it was the thing that got quoted the most. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe that should be like our motto. And when you really think about it, that is, like, and deep down for me, I think that that's the answer is mm-hmm. when this feels difficult, I'm probably trying to do it by myself. Either I'm not seeking guidance from someone who has done what I want to do, or I'm spending time and energy and my resources doing something that I could partner with another woman, outsource, delegate, and actually start to move forward faster. And so like the mastermind day that we hosted yesterday really had everyone look and get very honest with ourselves at where in our businesses or passion projects, are we stopping the forward momentum because we're trying to do it ourselves. And we're trying to do it the hard way because we're either afraid to ask for help we don't believe in our ideas enough to actually invest money in them, or we think that we could just do it better. Wait, did I say that as the first one? No, <laughs> no. You said like, afraid to ask for help. No, I was waiting for you to say the third know, one, which like, is, or you're being a control freak yes. and you need to let go of the reins a little bit and hey, let somebody I, else in. 
if I said that one twice, it deserved to be say, said twice because I know. That, that's always been the hardest one for me is like, ah, oh, screw it. I'm just going to do it myself. And you know, that's, I, that's not like anything new and, and groundbreaking. I'm sure other people have said that, but for me, it's like, no, it's the most ironic thing and no surprise that the motto started to become, we're not meant to do this alone because that is what I need to hear mm-hmm. is that I can ask for help. I don't, I'm not weak or I, I don't suck if I have to ask for guidance or mentorship. That's actually the smartest thing that I could do. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just like in love with you. I'm just falling in love with you over here. It's just, same. It's don't so mind me. I'm just like, oh my God, I love it. But seriously, because yeah. one of the things that I often talk about in my retreats and, and um, trainings and online communities is that healing happens in community. Healing happens in dialogue, right? We are, we are as, not just as women, as humans, but especially as women, really meant to be in community. And if you look at like what historically was like the grounds for that is like, you would die if you didn't have community because Billy is the one who's going to catch the fish. You know what I mean? And maybe you're the best (laughs) like carrot digger or whatever. But like, if you don't have each other, you're going to be malnourished. Um, Maybe you can't kill the saber tooth tiger by yourself. You know what I mean? Because those those bad boys are big and you need a whole team to do it. But as we've become more industrialized and urbanized and now digitally connected, we're, we're isolated. And so yeah. one of the things that you're doing, which is why I wanted to speak with you and get you on here is that I feel like you have this commitment to connecting women digitally, but also a real understanding of the importance of connecting women in analog, that we need to be together in person, yeah. face-to-face, to be able to hug each other, or if you don't like hugs, to be able to look to people face to face and just have that, like we have mirror neurons. There's actually this aspect of our our cognitive function and our like brain processing that happens when, especially with women, we sit face to face. Women have more inclination towards what's called external processing, which means that we actually figure shit out by sitting down together, looking each other in the face and talking, right? Yeah. So if you don't have that, and now I'm like preaching to myself, <laughs> if you don't, you, if you don't have it or you don't seek it because you're in that space of being either resistant to mentorship or just feeling like, you know, no one's going to do it as good as you, you know, really look at that and see if you can open yourself up to some form of community dialogue, support connection with other women. Um, And, you know, I was joking with my husband yesterday that I was like, my next business, I'm going to start, one of you is going to steal this. And when you do invite me, but I was like, I want to start a modern day red tent. So like a home, like buy an investment property, fit it out as essentially like a little retreat center, staff it. And any women who want to come there when they're on their period, (laughs) I'm not even joking, can come and it'll be like super cozy amazing conversation, obviously chocolate, maybe some wine, the best coffee, kombucha, but like this, like what if, and and not everybody can do this. And I I totally honor that I have immense privilege and that I'm self-employed and all of these things where I could, in theory, if my husband let me leave my three-year-old, I could go away for three days or at least those first two days of my cycle and really honor this cyclic seasonal nature of my being and just like rest. You know what I mean? But the biggest thing that I want in it is I actually want to be with other women on day one, two, and I want to be with other women all the time. But like on those first few days of my period, and we used to have this, we used to have the red tent, like that was a thing. And it was a thing for other reasons. It was a thing for like shame and like out making us outcasts from society. But before that, it was a thing for the priestesses to honor the ceremony of that time. And I feel like that's what these events are now, like the events that you're doing. I'm doing my first event in April of this year of 2020. And that's what it is. It's the modern day red tent. It's like, let's get together and feel this sense of not being alone and feel that we're not different from each other or from the people on the stage and just and yes, dance. There needs to be some twerking in there. You know what I mean? We gotta shake those hips. Like, but it's like 
every, I want you to think, you know, if you're, if you're a woman and you're listening, every time you have had that, and if you haven't, you better get your booty to my event or Lindsay's event or just any event. Just go. Just um, find one. Just Down find one. Like right now, next week. But when we go to those, we are elevated and uplifted and filled up for like weeks, if not months, if not the yeah. whole year after. It raises your vibration. And that, I believe, comes from the community of women. Um, and that's why I'm just so grateful for you, to, for the work that you're doing, because we just, we need more of it. And I'm so that glad that you decided to slay the dragon and to level up in your Super Mario Brothers game of life um, <laughs> so that you can reach a hand down to the, to the women who are like climbing it behind you. Word, um, sister. Yeah. So I know people have fallen in love with you just like I have. If you guys want to connect with her on the gram, you can find her at L Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y Schwartz. And that's in the show notes. Um, and also powerhouse underscore women, if you want to follow along with the brand. And if you want to connect with her online, you can find her at powerhousewomen.co. Um, and then is there anything, Lindsay, that you want to share with them? I know you shared a little bit of what you have coming up in the next year, but I like to, I like to leave people with, um, you know, if we just had a minute together, if we had a short elevator ride, um, or we're standing in the checkout line at the grocery store and you needed to speak life into me, you could just give me one little piece of advice, um, to help move forward with my dreams yeah, and plans. What would you question. say? And I think it's just that reminder that you're not meant to do this alone. And if you feel like you are alone, if you feel unsupported, it is your responsibility to go and find and create that support. Because there are women who want to support you. There are women who are on this journey and can pour life and belief into you when you need it most. And you can return the favor. And they're not going to come to your house. (laughs) <laughs> not going to deliver that box, that Amazon box with your purpose. They're not going to knock on your door and say, Hey, I heard you were feeling unsupported. Um, how you find them is you put yourself in the room where those kind of women hang out and what better place than a live event, or maybe it starts with a small meetup, but you're not meant to do it alone. And I think that's the hard way that's choosing to do it the hard way. If you are choosing to do it without that kind of support. Mm-hmm. I love that. And I love, I, it can't be glossed over that you said, find it. It's your responsibility to find it or create it. So it can't be an excuse if you're like, but I live in, you know, BFE, I live in the middle of nowhere and there's nothing here. Like, okay, good. Guess who else is hungry for it? Probably every other woman who lives in a 25 mile radius. So why don't yeah. you make it? Field of dream style, build it and they will come. <laughs> or if you, if there aren't like-minded people in your area, I mean, you and I are not sitting in the same room right now. There's this, you guys, I think this is really going to catch on, but there's this amazing thing called the internet. <laughs> I think it's going to be huge and you can Hot find tip friends. For savvy investors. <laughs> Hot tip. Get in now, ground floor opportunity. But seriously, like I, I kid you not. Half of the women that are now my closest friend started with an Instagram message that just said, you look cool. We should be friends. <laughs> now there are plenty of others that didn't get returned and that is their loss. They mm-hmm. are not now invited to my birthday party at hip hop class. But, um, you know, it just started with me being willing to reach out and, and establish that connection. Mm-hmm. And through doing that, I've found my people. Mm -hmm. And those people have poured life into everything that I'm doing, the moments that I needed it. They are literally the reason why anything that you see now, as far as powerhouse women exists, because I don't do any of this alone. And I don't think we're meant to. Oh man, I needed you today. Thanks, Liz. (laughs) Virtual hug. Yeah. Oh, squeeze. All right, you guys, um, connect with her online. Go say hi. Send her that message that says, hey, you look cool. Can we be friends? I promise she's nice. That's what I did. And she responded. And now here we are. So um, go connect with Lindsay. I hope you can make it to her event, Powerhouse Women. It's happening in Arizona. In Arizona in September. In September. So you have some time. Um, Lindsay, thank you so much for taking the time. It's a joy to be with you. This was so much fun. Thanks for having me. All right, we'll see you guys in the next episode.
Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me on another episode of Totally Stoked Podcast. If you love this episode, if it impacted you in some way, please grab a screenshot and share it right now to Instagram stories. Tag Stoked Yogi, hashtag Totally Stoked Podcast. Each week, we'll grab one listener who shared and send you some Stoked Yogi swag. Also, if you love the show, please subscribe, share it with a friend, or head over to iTunes right now and leave us an honest review. Your support and feedback make this show possible. If you have ideas about how we can improve, please send them to podcast at stokedyogi.com. Until next time, you guys, keep showing up, loving people, telling the truth, and remember, keep living your life totally stoked.